Chapter 11 One Hector, a piece of planet Earth I'm often told, why do you make such a fuss over one Hector? There are more important things. But in my view, there is nothing more important in our life right now than to return the Earth to its original flourishing state. And that is why I keep talking about a Hector of family land. Behind it, after all, there is something immeasurably more significant. I don't always have the reasoning and intellectuality, nor perhaps the temperament. To explain, th- to explain this, when there's even just a little breakthrough and people understand, well, I consider it that of it. On one occasion in particular stands out. The year was 2000. Zurich, an international forum. I was invited by the organisers and allotted to speak. I began talking about an idea that saw its birth in Russia, but the audience appeared all that receptive. Then there was a question from the floor. How do you tie in this hector of land with man's spiritual development? Perhaps the problem of land tillage is important enough for Russia, but these questions have long been resolved in Europe. We're here to talk about spirituality. A little nervous, I began my reply this way. I'm talking about a hectare of land and setting up one's family domain on it. And some people might think that's a rather primitive notion. We have to talk about the great teachings on spirituality, they say, because that is the topic of this prestigious European forum. I know, I was told by the organisers that sitting before me in this auditorium are well-known innovative educators, philosophers and writers on spirituality from all over Europe, along with other thinkers on this topic who are no less important. But it is precisely because I am mindful of the composition of this audience here before me that I am specifically talking about a hector of land. Ladies and gentlemen, I am convinced that concepts such as love and spirituality must necessarily have a material embodiment. The Hector of Land I have in mind, the Hector Anastasia speaks about, is much more than a mere Hector of Land. It is a space through which you may be connected to the cosmos. All the planets of the universe will react to this space, and consequently to you. They will be your friends, assistants and co-creators. In terms of the laws of nature, look what happens to an ordinary flower. A daisy, for example. This daisy is inseparably connected with the cosmos, the planets and the sun. The flower opens its petals when the sun comes up and closes them when the sun goes down. There are, they are at one with each other, in harmony with each other. Not even trillions of kilometres or light years could break the connection. They are bonded together the great sun and the little earthly flower. They know that only together can they be creators of a great universal harmony. But every single blade of grass on the earth reacts not only to the sun, it also reacts to other planets. It reacts to man, to the energy of his feelings. Scientists have conducted an experiment in which sensors were attached to an ordinary flowering houseplant and polygraph indicators registered even the minutest energy impulses coming from the flower. Several people were sent into the room in turn. One of them simply walked past the flower, a second went over and gave it some water, while a third went in and cut off one of the leaves. According to the data registered by the polygraph, whenever the person who tore off a leaf entered the room, the plant would get agitated and cause the indicator to jump. A related phenomenon can also be often noticed. Flowers fade when their owner goes away. The upshot is that all plants react to man. They may like a particular man or they may not. Consequently, they may transmit to their planets a message of either love or absence of love. And now, imagine that you have some kind of space, say a hectare of land. This isn't just any run-of-the-mill hectare of land where potatoes are grown for sale, but a hectare of land on which you have begun to create based on a particular level of consciousness or spirituality. You have your own territory on which there are a whole lot of plants cultivated, not by hired workers, 
but directly by you yourself. Every plant, every blade of grass will react to you with love. And these plants, as living beings, are capable of collecting for you all the best in energies of the universe. They collect them and offer them to you. Plants feed on more than just the energy of the soil. After all, you are aware that there are some plants that can even grow without soil. 5,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, there lived priests who created a variety of religions. And these priests were in control of whole nations. These priests were the richest people in the world of that time. The basements of their palaces were filled with trunks of gold and precious gems. They were acquainted with a whole range of secret sciences. The pharaoh turned to them for advice and money. But each of these highly placed priests had his own hectare of land on which he permitted no slaves to work. These were the richest people of their day, with a knowledge of a great many sciences. They knew the secrets of a hectare of land. On the walls of the ancient temples of Egypt, the priests' temples, was inscribed the warning, Do not accept food from a slave. This is one example. Here's example two. In ancient Rome, the senators issued a decree that if a slave was capable of working on the land and had been given land, then that slave should be sold to another master only if the land were sold with him, so as not to let any outsiders into contact with what was growing on that land. And why did the Roman senators give land to some of their slaves? And why did they give them money on top of that to build themselves a house? For one reason only, to obtain 10% of a harvest which had been cultivated and nurtured with love and care by the man growing it. It was only produce like this that could be at all beneficial. The Egyptian priests and the senators of ancient Rome knew that knew what kind of food was beneficial to man. The produce we eat today is in no way fit for human consumption. It's dead produce. There is a vast difference between berries one picks from a bush to eat on the spot and berries sold in the supermarket. It's not just that we've already started to decay, but there's no energy left in them that they've already started to decay. They are incapable of feeding man's soul. And I'm not even mentioning the mutant plants created by our technological world. So if you don't have your own hectare of land, there's nowhere that you're going to find food worthy of human consumption. You can take a little money and buy some sort of vegetables, but you must realise that those vegetables were not grown for you. They weren't grown for any man at all, they were grown for money. There is not a disease which cannot be cured by your space of love. The space you have created with your own hands and your own soul. People are the children of God. The world of animals and plants, the air and the space around us, these are also God's creations. And everything taken together is nothing less than the material embodied spirit of God. If someone calls himself a highly spiritual person, let him show the material embodiment of his spirituality. Imagine God looking down on you from above right now, and he sees someone driving a tram, and other of his children constructing buildings, Another standing in a store and selling things from behind a counter. These aren't the professions God created. They're professions for slaves. God didn't want his children to be slaves. And he created a marvellous world and gave it in stewardship to his children. Take care of it and use it. But to do that, you must understand this world. Understand what the moon is. What the herb known as the yarrow is. And what is a hectare of land? Is it a place where man must work by the sweat of his brow? No. It is a place where man shouldn't work at all. It is a place through which man ought to control the world. Tell me, who gives greater pleasure to God? A man driving a tram or a man who might have only a small piece of land but has transformed it into a paradise? The latter, of course. Can people today open up a road to the cosmos? Or can they be taught how to settle the moon or Mars? Of course not. Because
Um, they'll put weapons and pollution there and end up having the same wars there as on the earth. Yet man, after all, has been created to populate other worlds. And this will come about only when man understands and beautifies his own earth. The way to settle on the planets of the universe isn't technical at all. It is psychotelepathic. Man needs to become consciously aware of what constitutes the true beauty of the universe. Your city of Zurich is considered beautiful. We can say a thousand times how beautiful it is. But what specifically is beautiful about it? Yes, it is very clean here. Yes, it looks as though there are many well-to-do people living here. But is land covered with asphalt truly beautiful? Is it really good to have little green islands popping up just in certain places? Is it good that there's a dying tree, a majestic cedar, right in the centre of your city? It's suffocating from the smog. It's suffocating from exhaust fumes. And it's not the only thing that's dying and suffocating. The people walking along the city streets are suffocating from these fumes too. We should give some thought to all that we have managed to contrive on this earth. And it's best to talk about it in very simple terms. Let each one of us take a small plot of his land, put his whole mind and whole spirituality together and create a very small but concrete paradise. He will transform his little piece of land on our large planet into a flourishing garden, giving a material embodiment to his spirituality following God's example. If millions of people do this in a whole lot of countries, then the whole earth will become a flourishing garden and there won't be any wars because millions of people will be completely engaged in a grand co-creation. And if Russians should then descend upon Switzerland or Germany, it will only be to delight in the contemplation of beautiful living oases, to learn from their experience in embodying true spirituality. Russia unfortunately, is currently trying with all its might to be like the West. Russia's politicians are peppering their speeches with references to Western countries as developed or civilised. They are urging their people to catch up to them in development and being civilised. Our politicians still don't know that we have the opportunity not only to catch up quickly, but to significantly overtake them. And this can come to pass only if Russia does a complete about-face and starts heading in the opposite direction. This is in no way to suggest I am trying to denigrate or insult your Western civilization, But we're talking here, after all, about spirituality. And we need to be honest and sincere in what we say to one another. Spirituality cannot be measured simply by material wealth and techno technological achievements. Such a one-sided technocratic approach to mankind's development will invariably lead to an abyss. No doubt those of you gathered here today will admit this, but then you must also admit that you are running out in front with us right behind you. Try to stop and figure out what's happening to our world. If you do manage to figure it out, call to those running behind you. Hey! You better stop, chaps. Stop running. There's an abyss ahead and we're already on the edge of it. Find another way. If we really listen to our hearts together, we ought to go from simply talking about spirituality to its material embodiment. One hectare is but a tiny dot on the face of our planet Earth, but millions of these dots will transform the whole planet into a flourishing garden. Trillions of flower petals, along with the happy smiles of children and oldsters, will tell the universe that the people of the Earth are ready for a grand co-creation. And the planets of the universe will, will respond. We're waiting for you, man. We're waiting for you, worthy son of God. Our millennium has ushered in a great transformation on the Earth. Tens of thousands of Russian families have already aspired to obtain their own hectare of land. A father and mother who are actually creating a space of love for their children are more spiritual than the most celebrated wise men who only talk about spirituality. Let the spirit of each man spring up from the ground as a beautiful flower, a tree with fragrant fruit, 
and let this take place on every single hectare of our planet. After these words, for some time, absolute silence reigned in the hall. This was followed by thunderous applause. I spoke in Zurich on the following day too, once again to a full house. A number of our former compatriots were present here too. I don't think I came across too coherently, especially since I was speaking through an interpreter. But people stayed. They listened because it wasn't just me that was talking with this audience. A higher power was speaking. A very simple, specific, yet at the same time, extraordinary power. One that has been preserved for millennia in the depths of the human soul. A nostalgia for the true way of life for man as creator. And then I thought, do I really need to explain to anyone that all Russia's sons and daughters that have been blown away by an ill wind will most definitely return? Of course they'll come back. You will remember Anastasia's words. Mother Russia will greet crowds of guests on that day. They are all of the earth as Atlanteans born. As prodigal sons they shall return. Let all the bards everywhere play on their guitars. And the old shall write letters to their children. And the children to their parents. Both you and I shall become very young and people will feel young for the very first time. End of chapter 11. <laughs>